Hello and welcome. I am Exit Light and this is my channel. I'm going to tell you a story today, a true story. And you're going to think to yourself, have I not seen this in a movie? No, you haven't. However, it is so like a movie plot that it's unbelievable. You know how sometimes they say this, this TV show is ripped from the headlines or this movie was based on a true story? Well, this is real life that sounds based on a horror film. So join me. Get cozy. And let's talk about this, shall we? Anthony Bates was a one-eyed drifter. He came from Alabama. And at 32 years old, he found himself accepting a job in the Texas Hill Country, not far from the town of Caraville. Bates had another slight disability from his years of hard labor. His leg would easily tire because of a chainsaw injury. While Bates was hitchhiking to the vast open spaces of West Texas, he was lucky enough to get a ride and a job offer. The work was hard, but he was used to manual labor. The family had a 3,500-acre ranch, and on this ranch, they manufactured wooden keychains, and they needed help for the chores and whatever else they directed Bates to do. He said yes, and he would die within months lying on a dirty floor in the barn, and his screams forever captured on tape. In the Southwest, ranchers would often have to pull a living from the soil and hope that the weather cooperated. But this ranch, it wasn't any old timey operation and the drifters weren't a handful of depression area hobos either. In the 1970s and 80s, the Ellibrax recruited the men knowing that they probably wouldn't be missed. And if they were ever found, they wouldn't be believed. They needed the labor to keep their keychain factory going. Of course, Bates wasn't the only down on his luck worker they'd lured to a remote bunkhouse, only to face torture and murder. The Ellibrecht family and their foreman, Carl Robert Caldwell, went to trial in 1984, accused of running a sadistic ranch where drifters met their end and the arrests were mainly because one man was lucky enough to escape. Mountain Home, Texas is probably as isolated today as it was in 1984. It's located in the west central part of the state in the beautiful and empty hill country where farming is nearly impossible, but ranchers can make a living. The land isn't suitable because topsoil is shallow as the area is laced with rock just under the surface. The hill country stretches for hundreds of miles and it's occasionally dotted with oak trees and tall grasses. But the Elbrex, well, they didn't produce cattle or like many ranchers, offer their land for deer hunting, which is what they do, they call it a deer lease and they portion off sections and hunters who don't have their own land will rent it for the hunting season or for the year, whichever, um, and then it's theirs. And they can go out hunting whenever they want during hunting season, of course. And this is that situation they're talking about. No, they made keychains. They needed workers. Their pool of cheap labor in the surrounding area was pretty small. So they would find crews from nearby I-10. Wesley Sr. and his son, along with whatever foreman they had on hand, would stop, pick up a hitchhiker, and try and recruit him, telling them that they offered him a hot meal and a bed in exchange for their labor. For these men down on their luck, this sounded like a pretty good deal to them. They didn't really need much. But what they really could use 
was a hot meal and a place to lay their head. So getting workers was a breeze. And once they'd taken these hitchhikers to the ranch, their new employees found it impossible to leave. These new workers often stayed because they had no way out. They had no one to contact and they hoped desperately that conditions would somehow improve. However, the reality was imprisonment in a bunkhouse and torture with a cattle prod for even the slightest mistake. The worst infections, well, that was being unable to work. And that was a fate that befell Bates. When a huge posse of law enforcement from federal, state, and local jurisdictions raided the ranch on April 6, 1984, Delabrex denied wrongdoing, but their records which showed that more than 70 people worked there over the years. Well, that told a different story. The family would have continued taking men and women from the I-10 if authorities hadn't shut down the operation. And then the lawmen sifted through a cache of weapons and tapes looking over the ranch for evidence to support the story of their key witness, a man whose name was Travis Boyd. Boyd, well, he was the one that got away. He fled after he realized that he was trapped on the isolated homestead. The 38-year-old construction worker who alerted authorities testified later that he had seen Bates, but was subjected to the same ill treatment as he had been. Boyd, too, had arrived at the ranch after hitchhiking, but he wasn't the only traveler picked up by Wes and Junior that day. Once they got to the ranch, Boyd decided to only stay the night. When he started to walk away the next morning, he was accosted by ranch hands carrying rifles. He was told he wasn't going to go anywhere, and then they chained him up along with two other men. According to an article in the New York Times, Boyd was informed that they would be digging their own graves that day. Shortly after that, the three men were forced at gunpoint to dig ditches, during which time they were randomly shot with cattle prods. Boyd last remembered a knife being held to his throat before he finally lost consciousness. And authorities did believe him. So they mobilized to rescue five men and one woman from the ranch. They were strewn with 55 gallon drums and trash. The voice of Bates was heard on two tapes recovered at the ranch during that raid. On the tape, Bates could be heard begging, pleading with someone named Robert to please stop. The cattle prod was a common battery powered model called a hot shot that produced 4,000 volts of electricity. Mark Allen Hamilton who was a former ranch foreman testified about how the Elebrex liberally used the cattle prod, not just for discipline, but for torture as well. Hamilton stated that he observed other victims even being forced to use the prod on each other. In the case of Bates, who was unable to work. Hamilton witnessed the man being electrocuted up to 30 times, including strikes on his tongue and genitals. The torture sessions would last up to two hours and were usually supervised or carried out by Junior. Junior's wife, Joyce, was known for taking pot shots at rocks and bottles that she would place near the men and see how close she could come just shooting them without shooting the workers. Hamilton, along with four other witnesses who gave depositions, noted that Bates died from the prolonged torture on a filthy floor in the barn. Worse than an animal. The state had a lot of evidence incriminating Wes, Jr., and the ranch foreman, Carl. Despite the fact that the Ellibrecht family was known to go barefoot, even when in town, 
they were supposedly sophisticated enough to know they were fighting for their lives and they put their ranch up as collateral. They hired the best attorney that money could buy and hired Richard Racehorse Haynes. The prosecution presented their findings, 18 audio tapes providing the sounds of torture sessions. There was five eyewitnesses and forensic evidence, including human bone chards found on the property after they'd been burned to get rid of the men. Members of the community were not in the dark either. It was well known that the Elbrecks drove up and down the highway in their blue van looking for hitchhikers. The defense argued that without a body, there was no proof that Bates didn't just get up and leave on his own. He continued to be a hitchhiker, got on the I-10 and went away to points unknown. And let's say that he did die there. There's no proof that the torture we hear on the tape tortured him to death. The lawyer, Haynes, was a big name who showed up at the Caraville County Courthouse every day driving a bright yellow Rolls Royce. He played on beliefs in the community that even though the Elbrechts were odd, that they didn't seem evil. The atrocities reported by survivors of the slave ranch were numerous. Yet, Haynes, the defense attorney, pulled off another brilliant victory. The jury didn't fully believe the outlandish nature of the torture, despite hearing the tapes for themselves. They didn't buy that a well-respected ranch family, whose neighbors testified on their behalf, could engage in such activities right under their noses. How is that possible? And the victims, well, you know where this is gonna go, right? They were unsavory types. Some have been drug addicts. Most had mental illness. And therefore their testimony was suspect. When several survivor witnesses reported that they slept in the dirt, that they lived in extreme heat and cold and were chained up all night, the statements had minimal impact on the jury. The victims reported that they weren't allowed to leave and violence was a normal course of every day. The jury still unmoved. The ranch foreman, Caldwell, reported that torture did go on, but he claimed it was because the other workers hated Bates for being unable to do his fair share. So he was basically getting free room and board and they didn't think that that was right. He described a group of laborers tying Bates to a tree and shocking him with a cattle prod all over his body, including his empty eye socket. Caldwell went on to report in a 20 page confession to the FBI that after Bates died, weakened by weeks of regular torture sessions, he and another worker burned his body in a homemade funeral pyre while they played the Johnny Cash song, Ring of Fire. They deposited the few bones that didn't burn along with the ashes in the two 55 gallon drums. Shortly after that, Wes Elbrecht let Caldwell go. He drove him to a nearby truck stop and he gave him 20 bucks. The charges were initially murder and aggravated kidnapping, but the defendants ended up with very light sentences after being convicted of conspiracy to commit aggravated kidnapping. West Sr. received probation. His son, Jr., received 15 years in prison, but he served less than 10. Caldwell, the foreman, got the same, but only served four years, becoming a free man in 1988. Among the six people arrested and charged, only family members served 
even a tiny bit of prison time. The feds had pulled a mountain of incriminating evidence from the Elbrick Ranch, including those horrific audio tapes, witnesses, and actual human remains. They discovered cattle prod. They found various guns, machetes, axes, knives, chains, and padlocks. Yet, that had very little effect on the small town Texas jury. Ella Breck's business papers located on the scene revealed records verifying that dozens of men and some women had worked on the ranch over the years. Haynes's fellow attorney, Don Codgel, who helped defend Ella Brex, said of the case, it was some of the worst evidence I've ever seen. I totally thought we were screwed. This was the craziest case. But these were drifters and they were seen as less entitled to the benefits than the rest of us are. According to my San Antonio news, Bates's mother pursued a separate civil court case against the Ellibrecht family and she won. She received nearly half of the ranch, which is about 1,300 acres, which at the time was valued at $1.7 million. Now, the state of Texas owns the sprawling former ranch that once enslaved unwinning laborers. The spring and inspiring views of the hillside are still there, but the memories and echoes of victims have faded into history. Thank you for coming to my channel. If you would, please subscribe. And also, please give this video a thumbs up. It does a lot for channels. And please leave a comment below if you'd like. Thank you. And good night.